this is my uh, this is going to be my uh, review of these topics. These are the this is the next to last topic we have in terms of review. Um, so that'll be good. We'll be done pro by the end of um, April, and that'll allow us to do any last things at the beginning of May before our test on May thirteenth. At any rate, um, this topic, chapter eleven, electric force fields and potential. So forces either between charges or caused by a field, fields, um, which can be caused by charges, and potential, which is the same thing as voltage or potential difference, sometimes known as EMF, all those sorts of things. So um, key ideas are here. Neutral object um, can be polarized when you have excess, when it's basically induced. So. Um, you have a neutral object that's a conductor, meaning that the charges can flow, um, and it's close to another charged object. Uh, opposite charges will get on the near side, light charges will get on the far side. That does cause a net attractive force. These are all really good things to know, by the way. So in terms of these equations, which are back on your formula sheet, um, we're going to end up having... Uh, Most of these are similar to this on your um, AP formula sheet. So this is a little odd. It's the electric field between plates of a charge plates of a parallel plate capacitor, and this is the capacitance of that. Um, I would strongly recommend for capacitors you go back and look at the lab that we did online. It was those FET simulations. I think that's going to be really important because it describes. Um, how capacitors act differently when they're connected to a constant voltage source like a battery or power source and when they're not. So there's a lot going on there. I would strongly recommend that you look at that. Uh, general formula for electric force between two charges, Coulomb's law, general formula for electric field, force on a charge caused by the field and the magnitude of charge. Electric field caused by a point charge is this. So if you, caught, if you combine this formula with this formula between point charges, you would get this as an electric field from a point charge. Electric potential energy, electric potential, which is voltage. And remember that this is not a scalar, or this is a scalar quantity, not a vector quantity, meaning it can be positive or negative if the charge is positive or negative, but no direction. So voltage is a summation of um, the potentials or net net potential. Uh, I got to be careful with how I word that. I wouldn't say net because it's not a um, vector quantity, but the sum of all potentials is by adding up the individual ones. And you can have positive ones caused by positive charges, negative ones caused by negative charges. Um, so potential can have, be positive or negative, but it won't have a direction. Forces and fields. You wouldn't say that you have a negative field or a negative force. You would have a magnitude and a direction for these quantities. Um, notice that this is another way to look at electric field. This and this mean the same thing. And I went over in class why they mean the same thing, but that would be a good thing to ask me. You definitely should know the charge on a proton or electron. Probably, uh, that is not correct. It's negative 1.6, not, not negative 1.67. That is a typo. Um, I think they're confusing that with the mass of a proton because those are exactly the same. And they talk about that down here. So, I am sorry these pages are so crooked. Um, I think it's good to know that charging by friction, charging by contact or conduction, um, in fact, what ends up happening is in metals, remember, it's electrons that flow, even though by definition we think of fields as pointing from positive to negative, and we think of conventional current in circuits as positives flowing. So a little bit sorry about that, but that's the way things are. Um, induced charges, so this is a good example of that. If it's a neutral metal object, meaning it's a conductor, and you have this as being negatively charged, this will become polarized, 
and you have a net attractive force here because the positives are closer and they attract, and the negatives are further away and they repel, so, but there's less repulsive force than there is an attractive force. If you do provide a path out on that opposite side, those negatives would go away and you'd be left with a net positive charge here. That's kind of like an electroscope example. Charge distribution. Insulators do not have to have things uniformly distributed. Conductors do. So on a conductor, whether it's a nice spherical shape or regularly shaped, all the charges will be on the outside. And the electric potential or voltage is going to be the same everywhere. So that's true whether you have a weird egg shape or a spherical or any other shaped conductor. So even though the charges are closer here, by definition, the electric field pointing away from a conductor is always perpendicular, um, and it would be pointing out if it's positive charges. If the conductor has a net negative charge, the electric field lines would be pointing in. But again, they always act perpendicular to a conductor surface. So you have a spherical shape. The charges are uniformly spread on the outside surface. If it's not spherical, you have more charges piling up at pointed parts of the conductor but still the same energy per charge, which is interesting. And so the reason they pile up more here is due to um, the direction and, and how the electric field is pointing out quite a ways from each other. So an electric field, something like this, the electric field is pointing to the right. That means that this area is m more positively charged. This area is less positively or more negatively charged. So a proton or anything that's positively charged would experience a force in the direction of these field lines. Why? Because a proton would be, have a force away from positives and toward negatives. An electron would have a force directed exactly opposite the field lines. A neutron, which has no net charge, no net force. We did a couple activities where we were looking at vector diagrams for electric field also. Um, I think those were some FED activities. Yeah, they look something like this, which is kind of neat. Um, I would definitely review that to make sure you understand what something like this looks like. I think we actually had a free response that looked like that. Electric potential, I think, is one of the toughest topics. So um, the analogy that I used with this was basically that electric potential is like elevation. So you can have a positive or negative elevation. Electric field is essentially the rate at which that elevation is changing or the steepness. Um, so if I have something that is an equipotential surface like the charge that I showed back here, essentially is like saying whatever voltage this is added is not changing. And so there's no change in energy per charge no matter where you would go on this surface or in this surface. So it would be like you would be having a flat field um, gravitationally. You wouldn't be going uphill or downhill. So this is basically potential energy per unit charge. It can be called voltage, can be called potential difference when you're going from one to another. Again, it is a scalar quantity. Units are volts. Volt is a joule per coulomb, but it can be positive or negative. They talk about what grounding means here. So in this case, these would all experience the same electric field strength. Um, if these arrows are the same distance apart, although eh, it's a little hard to tell if that's true or not, because they look like they're, they might not be, but that's kind of interesting. However, this would be at a highest potential over here, because this is where you'd have positives, medium potential, lowest potential here. This is a really good I, comparison, again, with gravitational potential energy and electric potential. So this is an example of basically asking you what's going to happen to this positive charge if it's being shot to the right. It's going to slow down because it's heading toward a positive area. Um, and you could recognize that with the change in energies. 1 half mv squared would be the kinetic energy as initially. Q times the voltage would be the initial potential energy. And then at the end here, where this is zero, you would have had to increase by that 
however much the kinetic energy decreases, you would have had to increase by the same amount of electric potential energy. I think they talked about that earlier as a formula. Yep, right up here. This is something that a lot of people said they had difficulty with. So I want to talk about this a little bit, and that'll probably be all I talk about in this part. So hopefully you can read through the rest of it. So the idea here is that equipotential lines, and they call them isolines at times in the AP, I'm not sure why, um, show every point at which um, a charged particle experiences the same potential. In other words, the same energy per charge. That is true whether or not there is a charged particle there. So for example, if you have a charged particle here, this area would be one isoline. It would be at a positive potential because it's close to a positive charge. Here, this would be another isoline, meaning everywhere along this outer line, you would have the same energy per charge, the same voltage. It would be lower than this one that's closer because it's further away from the positive charge. Here, each of these lines that are vertical would be an isoline. The highest one would be over here, the lowest one would be to the right. So let's say, for example, if we add something like this, let's say that that might be 100 volts, 90, 80, and so forth for each of these three. So then this would be 70, 60, 50, 40. I don't know, but usually isolated lines are spaced the same amount apart. Okay. So this is an example here. Um, this is similar to a free response we had, and I forget whether it was again on a test or somewhere else, but I can pull it out if we need to. Um, if you look at this, this says that this area is getting less and less positive. So this tells me that maybe if there are more ice lines in here. Um, it might end up being um, something like this where um, eventually these could be negative and maybe there's a negative charge in here. So this is a little bit of an odd shape. So they have point A and point B are separated by 30 centimeters. How much work must be done by an external force to get from point A to point B? Well, that would be a little bit annoying, but <clears throat> if it's a proton that's got a charge Q, if you're going from A to B, you're going from 50 volts to 60 volts. So the change in potential energy is Q delta V. So I'm going to have Q, or 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Probably on this year's AP exam, it'll just be variable Q times delta V. So I go from 50 to 60, so that's an increase of 10. So basically, I would have Q times 10. Um, in this case, that would actually give me 1.6 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. And they talk about that down here. So it doesn't matter the particular distance it moves, as long as you know the difference in potential and the amount of charge that's moving. So this is a really good example also. I would encourage you to look at this, to think about how they might ask you to do this in terms of variables and not numbers. This is a big idea, conservation of energy here. So they're showing change in potential energy is going to equal change in kinetic energy. They might ask you to solve for something like that and not use any numbers, which actually you can do with, with a keyboard. This is kind of neat. So if I have something like this, 30 volts, 50 volts, 80 volts, something like that. Now this is odd that they're using a different scale here. They're saying this is 100, and this is obviously higher than 100. So basically what this would tell me is this is a greater charge than this one. Um, but it's a little weird because this looks about the same radius for the 50 volt one as this does. So I don't think this is a great drawing. But the big idea is you know these would have to both be positive because this plus 50 volt potential line is surrounding both of them. I would know that this would be a greater positive charge because it looks like the 100 volt line is at the same distance as the 80 volt line. And if V equals KQ over R, if I have a 80 volt radius here it would be closer. Ooh, so if it's closer than actually A, this would be the, the higher charge. Pardon me. I don't know if I said that correctly before or not. So this would be more charge because 
100 volts is the same distance as 80 volts is over here. So 80 would be somewhere inside that. Hey, maybe I can even draw that. Ugh. Red. So maybe 80 would be something like this red line right here. So since it's closer, um, that means it's a weaker charge over here. Wait, did I screw that up? Okay. Let me think about this. I'm going to do the math because I'm screwing up how I'm talking about it. B equals KQ over R. So now if I look at this over here, if I have the same potential here, this red line and this 80 volt line, and the distance is smaller, that means the charge must be smaller over here. So, okay, I was right, I think, the first time I said it. So I really do apologize about that. So this would have to be a larger charge because this is further out for the same potential. So essentially, these two would be kind of related to each other. So less distance over here, less charge over here. More distance over here, more charge over here. And the bad pit thing is, is I'm getting confused back and forth about this, which is a crappy picture too. Ugh. Special geometries for electrostatics. In between a capacitor, you have a uniform field. It is generally like this. Only around the fringes would you have a non-uniform field. It would be a little bit weaker. Um, we generally will ignore those unless they ask you, hey, how could the field change? Uh, or do you how do you think it would be different if you're in, say, this area as opposed to the very middle? And by very middle, I don't mean like very middle. It could be anywhere in this region here. But if you're not toward a fringe, it should be consistent electric field in between these plates. Positive charge, field points out. Negative charge, field points in. Um, they have things like this sometimes and positive negative charges and things like that and they might ask you for say um, the strength of an electric field in a normal year. I don't think they will this year because of the, the limitations of what they can ask you to type in. I think they might ask you about the direction and how you would determine say the electric field up here. So if I look at something like this, if I have red, I'm going to have the red charge, or pardon me, this is going to be, uh, A I'm going to think is going to be a red charge here. And notice that that's negative. Okay, so at this particular point, the electric field would point down and toward that. So if I was looking at an arrow, for example, The arrow would point like that. Now, if I think about the next one, let's do that as blue. Now, if I look at this, let's say that this charge, I'm calling the blue charge here, and now the electric field is going to be pointing away from that. It'll be the same strength of electric field because it's the same charge and the same distance from this. So what you should recognize is that the net electric field will be pointing to the left. The vertical spots would cancel out, parts would cancel out. Um, so that type of question could be asked, I think. They could ask you the direction and then how you would determine the strength, which is simply to figure out this electric field knowing this distance and this charge and then take the horizontal component of it and then add it to the horizontal component of this. I think they're going to go through how to do that there mathematically. I don't think the AP is going to ask you to do that mathematically, 
but I do think they might ask you to do it conceptually. So this is relating electric field to um, potential graph sometimes. I think this is probably good to know. Conservation of momentum. Yep, and then there's a bunch of practice problems. So there's a lot in here. I would encourage you to think about some of those and take some of those. This type of thing I think looks really good. Th these types of things I think look really good. Um, I really do think there's a lot of good problems in this. And the nice part is, is the answers are at the back. Ooh, I like that one also. Yeah, so hopefully you've got the hard copy of this. You don't have to look at my pages that are all catawampus. Um, but I do think that there's a lot going on there, and there's nice explanations. So that's good.